Well, thanks for the very warm welcome. I'm going to talk to the physical audience, which means you get to interrupt me with questions. You can't. <laughs> but you can, and that's your job. Um, let's see. I was asked to come talk about robots and to talk about it in a way that gets at maybe the essence of what I think robots are about. And I writhed over this from about 10 o'clock to midnight last night, thinking, what's the right thing to do? And in the end, I came up with four themes that I think interrelate in an interesting way. This is going to be good, and it's going to be bad. So gird yourselves. You're going to get some negativity from me. And that's what I often end up doing. I end up being kind of this, uh, this naysayer about robotics or about what impact it has on society. But let me start with the good. And we have to ask this question, what are robots? What do they mean to us as a society? And what do they mean to us in terms of who we are as people? Because they're changing our identity as humans. And I think it's important to understand that. First of all, about 20 years before most of you were born, there was a movie, Star Wars. And it was inspirational to a, set, a, a generational set of people who ended up inventing the robots that are now running either amok or running our wars for us or something, good or bad. You can kind of fill in the blank there. And the first word I want to talk about and the first set of examples I want to give you are really positive in a way. They're about wonder, about this idea of inspiring people to ask questions, to notice, and to be excited about our future. And movies do that sometimes. I mean, I don't think T3 in excites you about the future necessarily. But C3P and R2D2 do. And what's interesting about that is if you think about these robots and what they represent about us, they were imagined as objects that socialize with us and aren't us. They were clearly distinct from humans. They had different sets of capabilities from humans. They weren't trying to be human, exactly. And yet, they were able to fulfill a social niche, a, a way of collaborating with people that was powerful. And that inspires in us a sense of wonder. Now, the beauty of robots is that they combine this digital idea with the physicality. And the physicality can be incredibly important. A huge number of children find R2-D2 much more cool than C-3PO, even though it looks like a small round trash can. <laughs> the physicality of robots can set them apart from us. And the wonder that we get from robots, I believe, often stems from the fact that they're so different from animals and from human life forms. And sometimes we get away from that when we make androids. So just to drive this point home, just to show you another example that I believe exhibits the idea of wonder really well, as soon as I get my mouse, there's my mouse, go left, yes! Now we can play this for you. This is a salad bowl robot, um, as you've all probably built at home. It's a small salad bowl, gyroscopically stabilized from actually when some of you weren't even born yet. And in watching it, what you see is the behavior of a creature that didn't exist on Earth before humans built it. It's a robot, but it's a robot that makes you laugh. It makes you laugh because this incredibly simple form can't fall down. After all, what do you do to a salad bowl? Nothing. That's wonder. And that's the best of robots. That's the way in which robots can have mechanisms or ways of moving that set them apart from the real world in a way that makes it special and fills us with a sense of imagination. I have another example where robots become a lens for viewing the physical world in a different way. And this was an exhibit we did at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, again, before most of you were born. I decided to go historical last night. This is an interesting display. It's called Insect Telepresence. So here's the robot, and it's in a glass vitrine so everybody can see it. Um, and um, the robot is a giant gantry arm with a tiny little Panasonic remote head camera. This is before you had CMOS cameras, by the way. So cell phones didn't exist yet, and they didn't have cameras on them. So think about that. We didn't have cell phones, and, or these. Um, and there's Madagascan hissing roaches in there. And then you sit here and you use joysticks to actually drive the robot around. But since the robot's so small, the dominant male Madagascan hissing roach actually chases you around thinking that you're attacking the females. So you interact with the Madagascan hissing roaches in a way that humans can't normally interact with your average hissing roach. Or I should say the average human can't interact with your hissing roach. Some humans can, but they're really creative. And so this is an example of what that looks like. As soon as I get my mouse back. Nope, no mouse. OK. There's my mouse. Go ahead, click it. Thank you. 
So there's the remote head camera, and then it'll, it'll switch to a view where you can kind of see what's happening. But what's interesting is people would fall into this view where they become the documentary filmmaker, where they're changing the view. This is a Madagascan hissing roach, by the way, eating a pear. It turns out hissing roaches love pears. And in fact, in cutting up massive numbers of pear slices for these little animals, I grew to love pears too. So now I like pears a lot. <laughs> and every time I eat one, I think of hissing roaches. Isn't that romantic? Kinda. But you'll see the neck of the roach. I bet you've never seen the neck of a cockroach eating a pear before. It really, I can't say humanizes it, but it fills you with a sense of wonder about the natural world. So that's wonder too, but it's a different kind of wonder. The robot's a lens. It's a, a magnifying glass that changes the way we can view stuff in the real world. And that turns out to be really important about robotics and about the best of robotics. It gives us a different kind of relationship to the idea of what can be, to the potential of what, what the future can hold for us. Sometimes by showing us the physical world in a different way, sometimes by showing us beauty in physicality, in the way something can move, in the mechanisms. And I'm a big believer, by the way, in mechanisms of robots being obvious. The elegance that you get and the beauty you get is often in seeing the real mechanism of the robot, not faking it, as Hollywood would with pieces of plastic on top. Now, there's a funny thing that happens when we take this idea of wonder and we extend it. It's really wonder, you keep going with wonder, but we can start to make wondrously cool robots that look just like us, and yet they get spooky. This is my friend Ishiguro, he's the one on the right. <laughs> you could tell, right? And the one on the left, the member of the Uncanny Valley there, that's his robot. And they've made many robots that are in the form of people. And they feel like people when you touch their face, but they're cold. So they feel like you're touching dead people. Which is a little bit spooky, by the way, for those of you who don't know that that's spooky. <laughs> and you can control them, you can teleoperate them. But you enter the land of a kind of conceit. It's a kind of hubris. It's something really odd. There's something that happens when you make robots look like people. And that is the identity of people becomes blurred with the identity of machinery we start questioning what is it that makes us unique when we can make a robot that looks like us, that from a distance is hard to disambiguate from us. We start wondering what it means when you can have that robot at a meeting, talking, and not know whether Ishiguro is behind it controlling him from half a continent away, or whether it's uh, his secretary who's controlling it. Different gender, different human being, different place. And you can't tell. The fact that you can't tell what human is behind that physical form and that that physical form elicits in you a sense of humanity is confusing. And it's a certain kind of conceit that we humans seem to be launching ourselves into. There's other examples of this kind of conceit. This is a picture of the Dalai Lama with Boris Itzkov. Anybody heard of the 2045 project? Oh, you're gonna love this. You gotta Google this. This has a international conference every couple of years. He's a very wealthy gentleman from Russia. So here's the idea behind the project. And the New York Times reported on this, by the way, with no irony, no sarcasm, it was not on April 1st. And so this is, this is real. Let's see, how do I get, get there correctly? You've heard of the singularity. It's coming, apparently, we've been told. And that what it means is that robots will become as smart as people by the year 2045. So the 2045 project imagines a future in which we resolve the problem of global world hunger and war and poverty. And here's the plan. The plan is that all the groups, the NGOs around the world that help people who are hungry or poor, Boris here is going to be designing a robot vessel for humans. And by 2045, they're gonna train all the NGOs to start building these robot vessels, so mass producing them. And by then the AI will have caught up because that's what's gonna happen. Singularity, right? We're gonna have really smart robots. So in 2045, what they're going to do is take everybody who's hungry and poor, and they're going to download their consciousness into the robot vessels, thereby solving the problem of poverty and hunger, because robots don't need to eat, and they're not poor. Any questions about that? <laughs> no. Good. Well, you can look forward to that. I may be dead by then, but I guess some of you can get downloaded into robots. And this avatar project is real. As you can see, it has support from some powerful people. It has support from a whole lot of billionaires in the world, too, who'd want to be immortal, and this is one pathway to immortality, apparently. What's interesting about this, again, is it the form of conceit that it takes. Robot has become not C-3PO or R2-D2 anymore, but it's become an image of our future. In fact, it's become our evolutionary progeny. It's the thing in which we're going to download our consciousness and become the new us, the new evolutionary consequent. We're going to kind of jump out of the normal evolutionary stepladder and get on a jet plane and go somewhere new. 
Um, I'll give you another example, much more down to earth. John Dolcinos was the CEO of Adept, which makes these big robot arms. And when asked, what about people's jobs being taken over by these robots, he made this really interesting point, which fits into exactly the same theme. He said, well, you know, robots do things that robots are better for. People should use their minds. So it's okay to unemploy people by having robots do mechanical work, because after all, who wants to do manual work? Well, it turns out about 99% of humanity does manual work. That's how we pay the bills. And some of us actually really, really greatly enjoy it, right? I enjoy building a beehive. I don't want a robot to build a beehive for me. I actually want to hold the hammer. <laughs> but apparently we're supposed to use our minds. And no, there's not enough jobs for us all to use our minds, by the way. That's the structure of the world economy doesn't quite work that way. But the idea that robots are better at something that humans do is really interesting. The idea that they're better at using their hands, that they can be better craftspeople eventually. It's really fascinating. And if I go back for just one second to uh, my friend here, he has robot storefront mannequins that move in really beautiful ways. And they get dressed up in Macy's-like stores in Japan. And he was at a keynote speech that we gave together explaining why he makes robot female figures. And this gets right at this issue of conceit in a really interesting way. He said, because humans are inherently imperfect, and when I make a human female robot, I can make it more perfect than humans can be. So it can show off the clothes better than any human can. So you should think about that. What does it mean that the process of robot invention has become uh, sublimated into a process of improving upon the perfection of humanity? The measure, the yardstick we have isn't about what happens to society but about the idea that we're redefining what it means to be the best possible human in the form of a robot. That's what this one, this one, and this one are all doing. And that, I think, is kind of interesting. One last slide on this, and I'll go to my third of the four themes. James McGonagall, Jane McGonagall wrote a book called Reality is Broken. It's an interesting example of this, too. It's a fun book to read. Um, I disagree with most of it, but it's really well written. And what her point is, is that the real world is so imperfect. It's such a mess. Virtual worlds are much better. We can improve upon the real world by making a virtual world. And then in that virtual world, you can learn to do things, and you've learned in a more perfect world. So you're going to be more perfect in the real world, too. Kind of leaks back out in the real world. Again, that's a fascinating view, right? That doesn't say take the world, the physical world, as it is, and consider that to be its own image of perfection and learn how to deal with it. Learn how to be a good society in that world. Instead, it builds you a balkanized universe in the virtual world and says that balkanized land, that's the better world. It's as if I were to ask you, would you rather be downloaded into the computer, Tron-like, or stay in the real world? And you said, actually, the computer's it's much cleaner. Let's go live in Tron land. So again, that's this idea that the physicality of the real world or the limitations of humanity are limitations instead of what I think of them as, which is our characteristics, our inherent being. So the third one I have for you is agency. We've talked about conceit. We've talked about uh, the first one. What was the first one called? Wonder. Wonder. Thank you. One of the interesting things robot can do is robotics can be invested by us with agency. We can see in them a sense of narrative. And strong narrative on the part of the robot can be good or bad. Uh, now I'll start with the good. So here's a really simple example. We want girls and boys in middle school to become technologically fluent. So at the Create Lab, we developed this kit, this craft kit, where with cardboard and feathers and any materials you wish, you build a robot, then you program it. You choreograph it to do whatever you want. But in doing that, you invest it with narrative, right? And when you give it that narrative, you've made it fluent with expression, with human expression. Now, we don't do this in tech class. We do this in things like poetry class. And we do it in poetry class precisely because if you do it in tech class, you have selection bias. The kids who already care about technology take tech class. In poetry class, we get all the kids. And the kids come in and learn a poem. But when you have to build a sculptural artifact about a poem, you've got to read the poem 50 times. Because you have to decide what you're building physically. You can't just read it once and say, oh, nice poem. You can't do that. So if we can play the video, would you click on it for me, please? I think I'm at war with that clicker. Yeah, that'll work. This is just a quick one minute video that shows you a sense of uh, how these things behave. Who would go creative on Monday and masquerading? 
In this room, you see uh, some of our seventh graders. They are making a robot theater where poetry comes to life. They get a poem, and they must make a roboticized diorama to bring the poem to life. We're probably going to have like daddy standing somewhere around here and we'll have a motor with like a popsicle stick or something to knock him over so he falls into the pond. And we're trying to make a spin. Poetry can be challenging for a lot of kids. They don't like it, they don't understand it, and so I thought this might be a way to make it more fun. How do you understand a poem? It's the repetition of the reading of the poem that helps you understand it. So when you build something, you have to really think about it. They may glean some more meaning from it. On the last day of October, when dusk is fall, this is a way to be creative with technology. There's other ways in which robots invest us with agency that are coming fast and very exciting, and positive. One interesting example is somebody who has no arms, who using targeted muscle innervation, you can put sensors on large muscle groups like the pectoral group and have a robot arm where you're controlling every motor in the arm simultaneously. So now you can bend the elbow and open and close the gripper and rotate the wrist all at the same time. This wasn't possible before. This was far too hard. What's interesting is these kinds of robots invest we invest them with agency in the case of Robot Diaries, but also they invest us with agency. They allow us for the first time to squeeze a ball, to hold a ball, to do something that we could not do before. The robot is empowering us to have a new level of agency or affordance. And yet that agency comes from this collaboration between the human and the robot. The robot has microprocessors. It's actually much smarter than your arm. <laughs> and it can do things for you, right? One day you'll have an arm like this. Well, not you, hopefully, but if you have an accident, you'll have an arm like this. And you'll be able to tell it to break the eggshell open, and it'll do the breaking for you. So the goals that you set and the fine level of control you have between you and the robot, it's kind of like you and your self-driving car. And yet you're a team. It's attached to you. So your identity is going to be smeared across the identity of the robot and the identity of you yourself. Again, our identity will be challenged, even in positive ways. Um, then there's the example of threat. What happens when you take the idea of agency imbued upon a robot and go too far with it? When we start to give the robots enough agency, something odd happens. I get scared by it, and for good reason. A really great example are war robots, as, as Dustin pointed out, robots that actually decide when to kill people. And it's a really interesting argument because Ron Arkin at Georgia Tech makes that argument about autonomous warfighting robots, and what he says is they're more moral than humans because humans have emotion, and so they're subject to uh, emotion, and they can make mistakes. And then you... you dive into this with him and go, well, how do you robots know when to kill? And he says, well, I've just programmed them with the rules of war. So they just follow the rules and they don't know emotionally to ever break the rules. They can't do that. He said, do they make mistakes? He said, yes, but I've built guilt into them. <laughs> and so I ask, how do you do guilt? And I've read his book on this. Here's how he does guilt. He has a variable in the robot's brain. Those of you who code, it's a 16-bit number. Every time the robot kills an innocent person, the number gets incremented up. And over time, it decays down. And when you cross a threshold, it can't pull the trigger until it decays down. Then it can pull the trigger again. That variable is called guilt. Do you think that's how guilt works in the human mind? This is a beautiful form of semantic inflation. He's taken a word, applied it to a, some bits in the computer's brain with a very simplistic algorithm. And now he can say that my robot can feel guilt. And therefore, it has the right ethical boundaries for being a killing machine. But when we do that, your average decision maker in the war fighting sphere says, oh good, I can use this robot now. It's actually got all the right tools and it doesn't have emotions so it won't go and kill all sorts of children like all my soldiers might, which doesn't happen very often. But it's really interesting because again, what's happening here is we're taking this idea of agency and we're imbuing so much agency into the robot that we're crossing a line where we're willing to trust it with something that even with humans, we have trouble trusting them with it. And I think that's really a fascinating direction we go. And, you know, when you make a robot like Big Dog, which is about 12 years old now, you can do things like this. We can end up in a situation where we can kick it and videotape that and it's cool. But what you're seeing is actually an act of violence. But it's violence on a robot, so it's kind of okay, right? But what if you're kicking Ishiguro's robot? It looks just like a human. Is it not okay to kick Ishiguro's robot, but it's okay to kick Big Dog? It looks really cool. But these will be running through the forest. How will you feel about your 
grandkids running through forests and having these run through the forest too. Is that okay? You can turn the sound off on this. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nick. Pet man, a robot. It looks human enough that you start to wonder. If you see these on a construction site, if you see these driving heavy machinery, will you know that it's not a human? And if you won't know that it's human or not human, what will that do to the way you interact with heavy construction vehicles? When you see them, will you stop smiling or waving because you think there's a 50-50 chance it's a robot? How will you behave in a world where we'll have a harder and harder time disambiguating whether the social agents around us are being social to fool us into thinking they're humans so that we have good social interactions with them, or are being social because they're actual human beings with wetware and blood? And how will that change society? I don't think it's at all clear. One interesting book that also gets at this is by Simon Head called Mindless, outstanding book to read. He went and looked at Amazon. And I'll give you a quick example from Amazon because this is so cool. So they do this body tracking thing at Amazon where they look at how, how quickly in the warehouse you can pick and place boxes from the shelves to send. And if you stop, by the way, on the way down the corridor to check your email or something, they call it time theft. And they have a meeting with you, and they call you a robber, and they charge you for the time. So what's paramount is how many boxes you move a day, right? Now here is where it gets interesting. They're tracking your body. They can track your kinematics. They can look at how you move your body. So if you move your body like this, and then you bend down, and you pick up the box, and you get up, and you move like this, they bring you in and coach you and say, actually, you can do that much faster. If you move like this, cross your left leg over your right leg, pick it up, and go back like that, you can shave one and a half seconds off the total trip time. So they retrain your muscles on exactly how to move so that you can be a more efficient picker and placer of boxes. That's interesting because, again, in that case, what we're doing is perfecting the human motion, not for the sake of humanity, but for the sake of this optimal capitalistic construct, how many boxes you can move. We're turning you into robots. How odd is that? We're making robots look as much as like we, like, as, as we can like people, and we're taking people and we're actually training them to be as robotic as possible. What does that say about society? So my last two slides, and I'd like to open it up to hear some of your comments about this. What's interesting about this is I started thinking, what is it that we do? What is the creative work we do in robotics that can be so positive and so dystopian? Is there an obvious boundary between the two? And no, there's no obvious boundary. It's always a slippery slope, just like everything in life. But that slippery slope has these two interesting axes. We make robots that are different and unique and interesting and inspire wonder in us. And I love that. But we push it too far by making them as human as possible or by making them indistinguishable from humans. And it seems to me that we start showing elements of conceit, whether it's mental because we claim the robot has guilt in it or physical because it looks like us. You should see the experiments they do. They have females control male robots in Japan from Ishiguro and then interact with a the female. Then they interview them to see how they felt controlling a different gendered robot. And then they do things like have the human um, abuse the robot a little bit by tweaking its nose or pushing its cheek and see how they feel about being weird with this robot. This is what we do today. This is research. Then there's this other line, agency. We can imbue robots with agency. And at some level, that's powerful because they can share our narratives. But when we give them enough of that, enough sugar, <laughs> agency sugar, what happens is they make the decisions. And that seems to become a threat to our society, like with the ro war fighting robot. I can populate this with a lot of pictures. And it's interesting because there's examples I like. Examples that give us a sense of wonder, allow us to program systems, or allow us to share a narrative or explore something like air quality in the world. But then we have things like Bumbot, right? Humans at home making robots that actually are so filled with agency they're a threat to other people. This robot scares homeless off the sidewalk using a high-pressure water cannon. Home-built robot. Um, here's an example of one of the storefront robots with the model that was used to build it. Of course, he would claim it's more perfect than that. But it's odd, right? Watching her poke its cheek is actually a weird feeling for you in the audience looking at that. It's a strange thing. And that's the territory we're entering on this side. And of course, I wonder how you'll feel if you're taking a nice walk in Frick Park looking for morels and you see this guy. Will you be happy and say, hi, how you doing? You don't know if there's a robot behind that, a human behind that. You have no clue what's going on in its processes. And of course, we have machines that make decisions about when to kill. 
So what's the boundary line? What is it that separates the good from the bad? When do we cross over? And I think I have an idea that I wanted to share with you guys. It's just kind of a kernel of the beginning of an idea, which is, I think it has to do with power relationships. I think in, in, to a large degree, the robots on the left empower people. So the power relationship is one in which the human is on top. The human is using a robot in a way that empowers the human to become a better decision maker, become more informed, or be able to boost their voice about what they wish the world to be like. And what's interesting about the right side is, they're all cases where the power relationship is getting inverted. N not the controller necessarily, Ishiguro is certainly in power, but the user robot, the user human, I mean, sorry. So the human interacting with that robot has lost power. The robot's on top. You know less about the robot by far than it knows about you. You don't know who's controlling it, you don't know what gender they are, you don't know what purposes they have, you don't know how the robot works, and you might not even know if it's a robot or a human. So you just don't know how to treat it. And of course, when you're a civilian on the ground, there's been great um, stories from P.W. Singer about how autonomous drones uh, have made people in Afghanistan believe that America is with the devil. And you ask them why, and they say, well, because they can just blow us up and kill us, so they must be with the devil, because who else can do that? So you disempower up people to such a degree that you're outside their sphere of understanding of how the world can work. And at that point, you're going to become superstitious, because you have no other recourse. Um, so th I think it has to do with power relationship, and it's really interesting, because as engineers, we can build all of these. And there's no obvious stopping point that tells us when to stop. And yet, we can kind of ask this question. Is the technology we're inventing, is a human on top? Is the technology empowering humans in some substantial way? Or is the technology filling us with more uncertainty about our own future? I have one ad that I have to share with you. I just got the uh, Atlantic Monthly for June 2015, just now, in the mail, last night. And on the back cover, the glossy ad was on the back. And it was awesome, so I had to bring it in. It says, it's from Qualcomm, it says, when will our devices think for themselves? When we connected the phone to the internet, the phone became smart. That's the wrong power relationship, by the way, smartphones. When our next inventions connect billions more things, life will be even smarter. So life is about to become smart, and this is a cord of computer cables, and it says, why wait? So it's urgent. Let's just quickly dive in and do this, because why wait? It's a beautiful ad. I'll just pass it around for fun. I had to bring it in. Um, it raises all sorts of ethical questions. So those are the end of my formal remarks. Um, I'm curious what you all think about the disambiguation between when robots are something that we should embrace and when robots can change society in untoward ways. Thank you for your attention.